Yep. Okay, so the plan is I will read all of this out. Tick anything, tick anything you like the sound of or you think it's useful or you just thought, oh, that's, yeah, that seems true. <laughs> the key thing is, though, to like double or triple or even circle something where you think, I'm going to do that I, or I think I need to start doing more of that. Um, okay, so first of all, we're with Tim Chester. Now, you may not like any of these ideas at all and in the end, a lot of it is not scripture. It's just ideas that Christians have had about how to deal with busyness and how to have a better uh, theology of rest. So you may find you don't like any of it, but I hope you do find something there that's useful. So here we go. Let me read this from page one. If you see at the bottom, it actually says page one, and then if you turn on the back, it sort of says page two down there. <clears throat> okay, so here we go. Bit of Tim Chester. So the first thing he says, most of us try to keep going even when we're ill, and this quote today, 75% of us go to work when we're ill, even though a 10-year study by uh, University College London showed that workers who don't take time off when they're ill have double the rate of heart disease. Ouch. Uh, how do you know when you've crossed the line from good business to bad business? Other people tell us you're too busy. Uh, eventually, our business is causing harm in our bodies, our families, our churches, and our relationship with God. Our relationship with God is suffering. Paul Miller explains it like this. In his book, A Praying Life, he says, life crowds out prayer. We need to be watchful of that. Often it's as simple as this. If we're honest, saying yes to this or that activity is often saying no to prayer. And some tips from Tim. Tim's tips. Tim Chester. First thing he says, let's not over rely on binge resting. The body wasn't built for 48 weeks of constant stress, followed by four weeks of holiday, even though that seems to be what our culture thinks. Instead, have a day of rest. The biblical model, God's gift to us, is to build your rest into each week to have a clear day of rest, if that's possible. There are some seasons where it doesn't work as well. Um, Get enough sleep. So there's that long quote, well, some of the quote about sleep that we'd looked at before about how um, those people who used to get up super early centuries ago, they used to go to bed super early as well, basically. And so it was, it was manageable for them to get up really early and pray. For us, we need to get the, I'm, I'm summarizing, you, you'll know pretty much how many hours of sleep you thrive on. So get, try to plan in where possible to get those hours of sleep. Uh, and then the last sentence that he's got there, people who think they can operate with little sleep are defying God's created order. The third point from Tim at the bottom of the page is remember, you're not the savior, say no sometimes. Okay, over the page. Uh, priorities. And do tick any that you like. Uh, There'll be lots of very, very practical ideas coming up on the last pages. These are pretty practical as we, as we go anyway. Um, so priorities. You do have time to read the Bible and pray in most cases. It's a question of priorities. We have to say no to other things to say yes to time with God often. Time listening to him through the Bible and talking to him through prayer. It doesn't matter how busy we are. We, are always, we will always make time for top priorities like eating, and, but God is the, the top priority. So make a plan. When and where are you going to meet with the living God tomorrow? You might want to just jot that down. <laughs> if you, he has always been the top priority in this life, the life that he gave to you. Okay, so we'll carry on with some new information now. Helpful tips to avoid hurry sickness, too busy too often, to any of the ones you might like. I don't pronounce this this guy's name properly, I don't think, but ideas from Tim Chalice or Chalice? Not sure. He's a bit of a, he seems to be quite popular amongst evangelical Christians as a thinker uh, in modern times. He, if you Google his name, you'll find all kinds of things he says on the internet um, that are often helpful. Anyway, so he's also written a book called Do More Better, which is, I think it's quite helpful. 
It's quite a helpful book. It's not super helpful. It's, quite, it's very practical. Uh, so the first thing I gleaned from that is if you're feeling too busy, or you're feeling too busy, try to, try to narrow the focus of your life. As in, if you think about your whole life, your use of time, energy, money, try to narrow the focus to mostly focusing on the few things that you're really good at. I know that this is kind of idealistic because we don't always have the choices to do everything we want, we want to do, but as much as we can. Uh, the next bit, we, we do want to make the most of the lives God has given us, not doing, I like this quote, not doing more things, but doing more good. Because there's a lot of things you could do, but better to have the focus, how can I do more good for the sake of God and his kingdom and his people? Uh, in this world. Okay, the second one. Do you say yes to too many things? I like this. He says, learn the slow yes and the quick no. This might be helpful. Um, the slow yes might start with this. Let me have a think about it and get back to you. That is a, that is a slow yes. You might end up saying yes. The quick no is a quick no. Just go no. <laughs> Sorry, I can't do that. Um, in fact, we could, we could even practice that now. Uh, do, do please say, uh, do so, let me ask you something, uh, and I want you all to say no. Um, could I have a million pounds off you right now? No. Yeah, there we go. So that's the useful word to use. <laughs> if you want to be a little less busy, no. Did someone say yes? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Ah, they all said no, Nigel. Oh, no. Um, okay, anyway, what about interruptions? Interruptions. Um, are interruptions always bad in our busy lives? Not always. I find this interesting. Interruptions do not derail your real life. They are part of the real life God is giving to you. That's just adapted from C.S. Lewis. But if you look at the Bible, just look at the story of the Good Samaritan. Part of the reason the Good Samaritan is good is that he allowed his day to get interrupted to help someone in need. So interruptions are part of your actual real life, not like, oh, you're in my way. Mm. Anyway, that may be helpful. Let's, let's go on to page three. I'm trying to rattle through this. Tick anything that's useful. Now, these are ideas adapted from John Mark Comer, and the book is called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. This guy is very popular in uh, Christian circles, probably not so much conservative evangelical, but general Christian circles. This is a very hot book at the moment. People love this book. Um, there's a lot good about John Mark Homer. I don't agree with everything he says. Let's put it that way. But I think this book is really helpful. He talks about silence and solitude and just talks about Luke 5 verse 16 where it says, Jesus often withdrew to pray to be with his father. So should we. It's kind of obvious but important to note. And the way forward into um, less hurry and more time with the Lord he says, in, a, in one sense, it's so easy. <laughs> How do we get the balance right? All you do is just take a little time each day to be alone in the quiet with yourself and God. And I kind of put, yeah, with a Bible more often than not as well. Um, and he says, ideally have times where you spend a little longer with God. I don't know if you do this. Spend a little longer with God than just a quiet time, as in on the Sabbath or a, a periodic retreat as in spending a half day with yourself and your Bible and, and your God and a notebook, um, or even a, a whole day or a weekend on a particular retreat. Okay, Sabbath. More comments about Sabbath. If you live for 70 years, you can essentially have 10 years of Sabbath. Cool, what a great way on, what a great command. He says um, it's like commanding more ice cream or something. Have a Sabbath, you know. Wow. Um, worship on the Sabbath, he, he comments that Sabbath is not simply a day off. And I think for Christians, it's often like the Sabbath is it's just a day off, you know, and we're not quite sure what to do with it. Eugene Peterson, who, um, what did he do? He 
put the translation for the message together. You know the translation of the Bible called the message. So he calls, if, we, if you call Sabbath a day, just a day off, that is an illegitimate Sabbath. He uses a stronger word, but I didn't think I'd use it. He calls it an illegitimate Sabbath because Sabbath is more than just a day off. Sabbath is simply, you know, if you put it together, it's rest and worship. That is what we do on the Sabbath. This John Mark Comer, he has a broad view of worship in the holistic sense to include the ones that you might, things you might expect, gathering with other believers for church and doing your own Bible study, praying, listening to worship music and all those kinds of things. But also, this is where he's, as he's talking about um, how we almost celebrate God on the, on the Sabbath and every day. He talks about enjoying many of the good things that God provides, such as, you know, something you might do on a Sunday. You could tell he's American, or he's Canadian, maybe. mm, Not sure. Anyway, he talks about eating a burrito on the patio. Uh, I haven't done that ever in my life, but anyway, that's what he says. Um, Time, but, you know, you can translate that down to Derby. I'm having having a sandwich in the front room, (laughs) you know. I'm taking my time over it. It's got some nice uh, mayonnaise. Yeah, the good stuff. Not the stuff that's gone off, the, the new stuff that we just got the other day. Um, time with friends over a long, lazy dinner. Walking in the countryside with your best friend and eat. The, the quote in bold, anything to index your heart towards grateful recognition of God's reality and goodness. I like that. Um, yeah, okay. And then he, he talks about how we're a bit like, in, in our society, and he's thinking American society, but it's not that different, how we're, we operate a bit like we're in ancient Egypt, kind of as the, the masters of ancient Egypt, well, well, almost like the slaves. In the modern world, almost like a combination of the two, in the modern world, it's like we live in ancient Egypt as Egyptians with a continual lust for more. But when we Sabbath, Sabbath is a, is a way to start to break away from the continual lust for more over the page. So he, he, he says, you know, to try and push back against this continual lust for more, why not go a whole day without buying things? Break the cycle. Sabbath is a way of saying enough, enough of the endless Egyptian lust for more. And to change the modern mantra of 24-7 to, at the very least, 24-6. Oh, yeah, everything's 24-7 around here. No, 24-6. Draw a line in the sand and say, enough. Why strive for more stuff on the seventh day when I have enough from six? What I really want as a Christian is not more stuff, but rather, as a Christian, more time with God, with people, with the good things of God's creation, And a quote here, a meal with friends, time with family, a walk in the woods, afternoon tea. No, I don't know, afternoon tea. Wow. Slow down long enough to enjoy life with God. God brings the contentment that we can find nowhere else. On the Sabbath, we slow down, we come to a full stop. And also, slow down, if this is possible, slow down the other six days to get a good rhythm. There's a quote here, Sabbath is a spirit of restfulness and prayerfulness that goes with you throughout your week, living from rest, living from rest, the rest that God gives us, with nothing to prove. As Walter Brueggemann says, he's a bit of a theologian chap, anyway, Walter Brueggemann says, people who keep Sabbath live all seven days differently. The entire week leads up to this best day of the week. And in this way, Sabbath is enjoyable. It's not legalism. It's, <coughs> excuse me, it's living like Jesus. It's the way of living the life. Having the Lord's Day, a gift to open and enjoy that sets the tone for the entire week. Now, you might think, well, give me a real example here. So, John Mark Comer, he's got a wife, he's got kids, and, he, and he's a pastor. So, he takes his Sabbath... He starts Friday night and he goes into Saturday. He starts, that's kind of the, I think, that's pretty much how the Jews used to do it anyway. Start, the Sabbath would start Friday night and go into the Saturday. So here we go. This is what he says. Just before, 
and there's a lot of good stuff in here, I think, that we can, you can almost just take it off the shelf and say, yeah, we could do that on a Sunday or whatever the, the day is. Uh, well, for most of us, it will be a Sunday. Just before sunset on Friday, the family finish off the to-do lists, power down their devices. That's not robots. That's phones, iPads, laptops. And they put them away in a box in a cupboard. Wow. Gather around the table as a family. They have wine. Okay. My dad wouldn't like that, but, you know, Jesus turned water into wine, and we have that recurring debate with my dad and myself about wine. But anyway, um, candles. They have candles out. It's nice. When did you last get candles out, you know? Candles. They read a psalm as they go into the Sabbath. Pick a psalm. They pray. Then we feast for 24 hours. Sleep in, read our Bibles, pray more, spend time together, talk, laugh. In the summer, they walk to the park. In the winter, they make a fire. I'm imagining they've got this vast house, but I might be wrong. The enormous garden where they gather the firewood. I may be wrong. Um, they get lost in good novels on the sofa. They cuddle, they nap, they sit by the window. Being. Oh, I like this quote. It's like a less stressful Christmas every single week. <laughs> Free from the need to do more, to get more, and I find, I like this, I find that my ordinary life is enough. Page five. So uh, these are the following, what is it? 14 ideas are ways that you might deliberately slow down. Some of them you might think are completely stupid. But um, I've already tried a few of these things, and I quite like them. <coughs> See what you think. See if there are any of these that you would like to do. Like, um, Yeah, well, here we go. Ways to force yourself to slow down so you were not caught so much in the rat race. So the first one, if you drive, drive the speed limit. Not what I can get away with. Like, oh, it's probably okay, 33 and a 30, yeah? Um, but to go... Bang on, 30 in a 30 zone. Don't do 25, it'll annoy everybody. And they'll try and overtake you and cause accidents. But 30 in a 30 zone. Why not sometimes, even on the motorway, get into the slow lane, settle in, even if the person in the front only doing 55, and even pray. Obviously, eyes open. Right. The second one. Why not sometimes show up 10 minutes early for an appointment without your phone? You could chat with another human, read a book, pray. Um, these are the kind of, these 14 are the kind of ones you might want to circle and just go, I am going to try that. I'm not saying it's going to do massive things for your spiritual life, but it might help. Okay, number three. Get in the longest line at the supermarket, I challenge you. And why would you do that? It's a way to slow down and come off the drug of speed. Not actually the literal drug of speed, but the, 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 the desire to just be Fast, 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 fast. And in that queue to pray and maybe to think how you would express the love of God to the person at the checkout simply by saying hello, asking a few questions, saying thank you. A little quote here. The person serving you at the checkout is not an ATM. They are a soul. I have treated them like ATMs most of my life, to be fair. Just like, thanks, yep, great. In the bag, off we go. Waiting is often just really good for us. It's handy to get used to not getting what we want immediately. Then we're less likely to get angry about not getting things immediately because we have acclimatized ourselves to those little delays in life. Number four, turn your smartphone into a dumb phone. What does this mean? Well, the, suge <laughs> the suggestion is take email off your phone. I am... So yeah... I struggle with that one. But anyway, take email off your phone. Take social media off your phone. Transfer email and social media to your laptop. Plan in time when you can check these things daily or weekly. Delete all the notifications. The things that kind of like beep and blast at you all day long. Try, you can switch those off. Um, ditch news alerts. They are the devil, he says. <laughs> okay. Keeps flashing up. This really bad thing happened in somewhere in the world. Um, Delete every app that you don't need or that doesn't make your life seriously easier. Keep all the wonder apps that do make life easier, like maps, calculator, etc. Reduce lots of your apps into a few simple boxes on the screen. Now, I've got to say, this is all, none of this is like the Bible is telling you. 
it just might be smart. And you might just go, number four, I think it's rubbish. Like, I'm not going to lose any sleep if you think number four is rubbish, but I think some of you might find it helpful. <laughs> so ditch the ones you don't want. Pick the ones where you think, you know, that might actually help me to just chill a little bit, spend a bit more time thinking about the Lord and praying and thinking about people. Okay, number five, parent your phone. I really like this one. He says, put it to bed before you and make it sleep in. So for him, his family, his kids go to bed at 8.30 and the phones go to bed at 8.32 in a drawer in the kitchen. So if you want to rob them, their addresses. No, I don't know. I don't know where they, I don't know where they live. Um, number six, keep your phone off until after your morning quiet time. I am trying this. I'm trying it. Win the day, he says. Sad stats. 75% of people sleep next to their phones. And 90% of us check our phones as soon as we wake up, wherever the phones happen to be. Do not let your phone set your emotional mood at the start of the day. Number seven, set times for email. Do not have email on your phone again, uh, over the page. What day time should we be checking emails? He suggests no more than twice a day. And he says, I'm really bad at this, but he says maybe 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. And then he says this one, the, remember, the more email you do, the more email you do. As in, if you keep replying to all the emails really, really fast, you'll just get more and more emails than you would have had. Uh, doesn't mean spend like, take forever to reply. Number eight, set a time limit for social media or just get off it. Number nine, kill your TV. TV, just a comment about TV and film. TV and film uses up 35 hours a week, five hours a day for the average American. It's probably similar here. Is this really a problem though? You know, binging on Netflix, what's the problem? Yeah, it's a problem because what we give our attention to is the person we become. Comer comments, there is very little that he can watch as a disciple of Jesus Christ. My parents end up seem to watch all the old stuff on the retro channels because all the other stuff, they're just like, what is this? Seems to be murder mysteries 24-7 in my parents' house. (laughs) Anyway, giving too much away. He says, and yet many of us watch loads of terrible telly. Why do we make it so easy for Satan? Turn your TV off realistically. Set yourself a time limit way below 35 hours a week because our time is our life. Number 10, oh, this is controversial. Embrace single tasking. And just to flag this up, a lot of Christian books that try to tackle busyness, they nearly all have a big problem with multitasking. And they are all for single tasking, which might sound like a nonsense because we're so like, multitasking's great, we all need to be multitasking all the time. Uh, okay, so Coma says multitasking is a myth. We can only, well, it is and it isn't, right, okay. I've, I've got a thing to say at the end of this, but we'll just see what he says first. Multitasking is a myth. We can only really do one thing well at a time. Walter Brueggemann goes on, multitasking is the desire to be more than we are, to control more than we do, which yields, I like this, a divided self with full attention given to nothing. It's kind of true. It it is far better for us to be fully present in the moment to God, to people. Okay, and then I say, Steve T, there I am. I say, I don't think we can ever get rid of multitasking completely. Like, ask any mother. Oh, don't multitask. Like, say to Jenny, don't multitask. Uh, How am I going to live? How's Katie going to live, you know? But we should certainly challenge multitasking as a lifestyle and question, I am questioning myself if I should be multitasking as often as I do. Number 11, try this, walk slower. I was talking to Marg earlier that I'm trying to walk slower. She was like, oh good, <laughs> oh, good. as I was walking with her. I'm like, um, <laughs> force yourself to move through the world at a relaxed pace. The idea is, that we're not just like rats in the race and that we do put these little things in place to kind of go, no, I'm not a rat. I'm a child of God. Why am I racing everywhere? Why am I like timing everything to the second? I've got to be there. Oh, that's going to take me five minutes. I'll see you in five. Go, I'll see you in 10. See you in 10. 
I mean, not forgetting what we read in Proverbs 6, verse 6 and onwards, that there's a lot of stuff to do. So we're trying to find a balance. Number 12, take a regular day alone. Uh, Does this sound like you're a monk or a nun? Take a regular day alone for silence and solitude. He says, I take a full day once a month to be alone with God. And he does it like this. He says, he wakes up early, he drives to a local abbey, (laughs) and he books a room with the local monks. He really does. A slow, easy day. He is a pastor, right? But he goes on after this. A slow, easy day full of reading and praying and occasional napping. And he does a bit of a review. He says he looks back over last month and he looks at the month ahead. So, you know, diary. You get your diary out. He tracks his progress. He journals out some thoughts as he writes some, some of his thoughts down. But then he says he really wishes that most people did this, whatever their life situation. Don't just let the pastors have the good time. Why, why, you know, is there room for you to have such a good time as well? Just block a day out. People are like, what are you doing on Saturday? Ah, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm having a bit of a retreat day. A little smile on your face. You're like, but you're not a pastor. I know. But I've got a really good God. And uh, I want to be listening to him. I want to be talking to him. Okay, and then 13, take up journaling, if you want. Write down your thoughts and prayers. It, it makes you, you can't, well, most of us can't write as fast as we speak and think. So it kind of makes you slow down when you're praying and you're thinking. Meditate, number 14, like in Psalm 1, not like in, uh, we're not trying to turn everyone into a Hindu here. It's, uh, there's meditation in Psalm 1 and elsewhere in the Bible. As in, fill your mind with truth. Take time to read, study, and then reread a psalm, a Bible passage, a verse. Commit it to memory. There are loads of ways you can meditate. That's just very, very brief. There was another sheet, but we're not going to do that because <laughs> it was already enough. So the plan is... We haven't got any time, have we? We've got about five minutes. Right, so... Um, I... Uh, this is really awkward because I haven't asked anyone to do it, but I'm looking at Phil, Andrew, and Nigel and wondering. (laughs) (laughs) Dave! (laughs) So you can say no, yeah, that's true. Um, Or it could be just a collective hive mind if no one wants to do it. Okay, so, uh, yeah, but that's... (laughs) It's um, what I I was getting at that moment is we've been listening. That's brilliant, Sue. (laughs) So, the plan is, on your table, start on page one, we've only got five minutes, and if there's anything that jumped out at you that you want to talk about, talk about it, we only have five minutes. Or you might go, I, to be fair, just pick any page, anything where you think, do you know what, I might just do that, and try and explain. So, not, not the stuff where you think, oh, that's a load of rubbish, I'm not going to do it, because we haven't got time for that. Let's go for, what did you actually think, do you know what? I might do that, I really fancy doing that, uh, because, well, you might not have a reason, just say I fancy doing it. Okay, so we've got five minutes, and uh, does that sound vaguely clear? We've got five whole minutes. Go for it, right.